All right there, I've got a real treat for you in this video. If you haven't seen the other video I made about culture and the laughter track, which includes a, a clip from Friends, you know, the sitcom Friends, with no laughter track, I suggest you go and watch that first because it, it will make this one make more sense and there's a better payoff in this video. There's a link in the description of the previous video. But if you have seen it, stick with me. So I looked a little bit further into the whole laughter track thing and it turns out it Bing Crosby you know the singer Bing Crosby used to have a radio show in 1946 and he decided to record it and this this was quite a strange thing in 1946 most radio shows at the time went out live and Bing Crosby had this kind of country boy well that was his character a comedian called Bob Burns who had this sort of quite lewd for the time sort of uh comic character and they'd, they'd do little sort of sketches on the show and and there, there was a sound engineer a bloke called Jack Mylan and he, he recorded the laughter that um, Bob Burns Bob Burns's act produced separately to Bob Burns's track so he then had essentially what we now call a laughter track and then a couple of weeks later when Bob Burns come back and didn't quite hit the mark that he did the other time Jack Mylan dubbed over the previous week's laughter track. So from its inception, from its, from its first use, the laughter track was already there to make not-so-good comedy appear better. And it immediately worked. He recorded it on a German bit of kit called, called the magnetophone. And it was kind of like your early, the earliest reel-to-reel. -reel. And, and it's, it's quite an amazing thing because... You know, almost instinctive. Well, if it's not that funny, just 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 give it the sound of loads of people laughing. And I like I like. There's something beautiful about that. Just knowing, just just understanding the kind of function of laughter, that sort of thing that brings groups together, and knowing that the people back home, when they hear that laughter, there's that signal. There's that. There's a message there that this actually is funny, not the content but the, the message that comes with the content. And, you know, it, it reminds me of <coughs> later on, Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message, and you, you kind of understand that with the laughter track. Anyway, a geezer called Charlie Douglas, who I think was part of the sound engineering crew at the same radio station, although that information is a bit blurry, he obviously got wind of all this, and he invented a thing called the laughter box, which was a unit that you could go into any any of the any studio and dub over laughter in different sort of you know different lengths, different volumes, different different kinds of laughters depending on what the uh, what the content was. And all the major studios used this this Charlie Douglas's laughter box, and that was it. After that, every single TV and radio show used a laughter track. It's kind of amazing. Now, in the last video, I showed you a clip from Friends with no laughter. And it's just bizarre. It's, it's clunky. It's totally artificial. It's unreal in every way. But what I've dug up here is just brilliant. So you've heard something that you know with the laughter track missing. I'm now going to play you a clip of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Everyone knows The Shining, amazing film, terrifying. And it's the, it's the proper axe through the door, here's Johnny. Horrible, frightening. I'm, not a, I'm a fan of The Shining, but horror isn't, isn't really my thing. But this has got a laughter track on it. And just, just, just get your head round how much a laughter track affects the content. And actually dominates the message. Have a look. Wendy, I'm home.
come out, come out, wherever you are. Chinny chin chin. Then I'll puff. And I'll puff. And I'll blow your house in. Sweet.